Good morning, Bucknutters. It is Thursday, September 22nd. I am Dan Rubin. This is the Bucknuts Morning 5 and Change. I tend to go slow here at the beginning to make sure everybody with eyeballs gets on here. We are live on YouTube, Twitter, and Facebook. Usually on Thursday, when you sign in here, you see three panels. Today, just two, the Dean of Ohio, Ohio Recruiting, Bill Kerlick, has some family business to attend to. So that means it's all Porter all the time. Mark Porter is here. Mark, how goes it? Good. I don't mind easing into this either. I'm sure it's early and people don't want to start off with rapid fire. So we have a ton of stuff to get into. Uh, Obviously, Ohio State will be hosting Wisconsin this weekend. Another night game. Those of you burning the midnight oil and joining us for what we learned live afterwards, we appreciate that. There will be another Dave Biddle after dark performance this weekend. But we're going to start out talking about something that uh, I can tell you from our page views and everything else. There's a tremendous interest in. And that is Jim Knowles and the Ohio State defense. Mark did an excellent breakdown, as he does every week, breaking down the key plays of the game and our Buck Eye and the Sky college feature. We also do one the next day on the high school gridiron action of the week that you need to check out. But Mark, in layman's terms, we've all seen how much better the defense is in one year without a major changeover in personnel. How has Jim Knowles done it? Okay, so well, let's start off going back to last year. We've been doing this eye in the sky for a couple of years, and I believe it was the Oregon game last year when we broke down the defense. Uh, the word vanilla was screaming. You know, Ohio State was lining up with their linebackers four or five yards off the ball, sometimes deeper, uh, basically in your standard alignment like you'd see them on a chalkboard. And I think Ohio State, when they were playing lesser opponents, could be cavemen and just out manhandle their guys. And it didn't really matter what defense they lined up in. They were good enough to play a base look and, you know, go out there and play a, an average team and be good. But when they played better teams, those base looks uh, needed to be schemed up and you needed to be able to do some things and adjust to some things to, to play those better teams and to give them some fits and some dilemmas. Uh, obviously that didn't work last year. And Jim Knowles comes in and he brings the most complex defense I've ever broken down. If there's one more complex out there or someone running something a little more uh, disguised than Jim Knowles, I'd like to see it. Uh, starting with the spring game, we went back and we said, what is this defense? What is going to be so different about it? And, of course, the 4-2 with the three safeties is the big difference. And these three safeties, one of them is always going to be a linebacker type, and if not all three, but they're, the, they're going to be the eighth guy coming down in the box or the seventh guy coming down in the box most plays. Uh, so when we're breaking this tape down – Boy, it takes me a while to pause it, watch it, rewind it, pause it, watch it, rewind it, and watch all the guys moving back and forth. That tells me if it's taken me that long that opposing quarterbacks with under five or six seconds walking to the line of scrimmage have no chance. I, I honestly believe that any quarterback as experienced as you might be walking to the line of scrimmage against the Jim Knowles defense, you will not know what coverage you're getting till after the snap of the ball. It may be lined up in cover two, and roll back to cover two. But there's going to be a rotation. There's going to be something that happens. Uh, you're going to be lining up in cover four, going to three, three to four. Uh, you're going to be lining up in alignments that are not traditional. I don't want to say they're junk looks, but they're things that if you drew up on a chalkboard, guys would sit there and go, what actually is this defense? It would be hard to classify. Uh, you use the word layman's terms, and I think I've tried to break these defenses down in the layman's terms, not get overcomplicated with all the terms in the staff room about the jack and the all these different nicknames right. and just call people what they are, Sam, Mike, and Will, free safety, strong safety. You know, And I know they have appropriate terms, but a lot of times when I start reading breakdowns like that, I even I get lost. So I try to really simplify things. But even from that perspective, with the simplification, it's hard to identify the Jim Knowles front. And what it's done now is put the players advantage player. They're not sitting back in vanilla looks where teams look at you on film all week and and basically tee off on you. There's nothing to tee off on. You're not sitting on a tee waiting for anybody to hit you now. You're moving around. You're disguised. You have them on their heels. Uh, when I'm watching film now, 
there's actually plays that the Jim Knowles defense blows up at the snap of the ball because they're shocking the other team with what they're rolling to or the way they're blitzing, where that wasn't happening as much. Now, conversely, you may give up a big play because you're gambling a little more and you may be rolling the dice, but this Jim Knowles defense isn't, uh, I don't want to say it's not loose and reckless. It's not cover zero with no one over the top. Right. It's, it's just disguising a lot of basic coverages without getting into the NFL schemes with nine guys walked up and different man coverages and that type of stuff. So uh, very difficult to decipher, but not a very difficult defense to execute. You know, it's still coverages that you've ran in the past. It's not like the Ohio State Buckeyes from last year didn't run some of these same coverages and same looks, but definitely in a different way, definitely from different alignments. And as you can see, I could probably talk about this defense all day. I see questions on the board like, can the 4 2 5 stop the run? And when I read that, I kind of chuckled. I, and it said, Jim Knowles uh, thinks his 4 2 can stop the run. Yeah, because it's not a 4 2. And everyone keeps calling it a 4 2. At the snap of the ball, there's always someone else coming up. So it goes right back to the 4 3 or the, you know, the eight man fronts. So, you know, there's a little trickery in the name of it, even where people are like, oh, it's a 4 2. We're so in trouble with the run. Yeah, watch the film, and, you, and you're really not. You're just kind of disguising everything by three or four yards. So I'll, I'll let some more questions come in. I know I just gave a uh, the dissertation-type answer there on your question, but you know it's early in the morning. I hope people followed it. We call that depth. Uh, I got a chance to see the defense in person this weekend. It's always interesting to me to get to see the team uh, in person from Mr. Bucknut's seats, which, in my opinion, are the best. You get a great look at it. Having been to a trillion games, very little separation on defense. I know you're saying it's complicated and stuff, but like I didn't see very many busts. There was never like the last few years you'd, you'd come in there and every 10th player or so you'd see a guy just running free and you knew he was unaccounted for and something had gone wrong. As complicated as this may be and the personnel may be a bit better, but they did that did not happen. From a personnel you know perspective – that, that's a great point early in the season. You know, if we were going to see the bust and the, the breakdowns, they would be showing up week one, week two, week three. And, you know, versus Toledo, you'd maybe see a few more. But you're right. There aren't busts on tape. I think the, the only bust we saw was on the first play of the season. Uh, Notre Dame threw a hitch into the boundary up on a corner blitz, and the safety was there. He executed it. He, missed the tackle. he just missed the tackle. Yeah. So, you know, what kind of busts are they? I, I don't know. So from a cornerback blitz, a, a, so, a somewhat – complicated scheme uh we're not even busting by the way the individual who missed that tackle was yanked and didn't come back in so that might have actually sent a message of positivity that uh, worked out having broken down the film now schematically on defense name a couple individuals that have jumped out to you yeah i've been a uh, jt timalua fan i i think he is going to be outstanding his high school tape was one of those ones when i started talking about it i'm like you better be right because you're making this kid sound like he's one or two and done and straight to the NFL. And yeah, he's done that. Michael Hall, uh, of course, locally around here in Streetsboro, it's, it's kind of a close, so I've been familiar with him. And like I said last week, people have been hyping him for, since he was a freshman in high school before there was a thing called hype. And now he is delivering on it. Uh, Jack Sawyer, uh, those, those front four do more up front to make this defense work than we give them credit because what we just alluded to, we're not sending the farm to help those four. That, that front four is getting it done, and that's allowing us to play the base cover threes, the base cover four, cover two, the three unders and the three overs, keeping more guys back there where you don't have to sell the farm and bring guys because your one-on-one -on -one pass rushes are working. Uh, Michael Hall is literally unblockable with his first yeah. step. I mean, he might not get there every time, but he's penetrating the gap. He's getting washed away from the play. I mean, he's really – someone you have to deal with when you see him on film. Uh, and I'm happy that those guys are so young. It's, it's you know, nice to see the future of this defense with the, the youth, and you get a couple years to watch these guys play. So we've really hit it perfect down the middle here, and I'm, I'm sure Coach Knowles is happy to have his front four like that. But there are other guys on the back end that have come in, but really that front four has been the difference. No doubt. When you it's It's a classic football statement. This doesn't take a Masters like Mark has to know this, but if you – the quarterback without blitzing you just have a better chance mathematically to cover dudes it's you know i'm a dallas cowboys fan for my whole life i, I think they ran the most ba the, the, the the dynasty cowboys were the most basic offense of all time it's like you put an extra guy in the box we're throwing it 
You pull the guy back, we're running it. It's just that simple. We can man-on-man you up. We'll be good. And Ohio State, from a talent perspective, I mean, there's no team in the country they can't just line up with and play. I want to talk about one more guy before we get to the questions here, and that is Elias Rudolph from Taft. You saw him this past weekend. The most interesting thing that I got out of your report is where they are playing him. He's position in high school. He will not play in college. Uh, take us through what you thought of him and um, maybe his upside as a possible Buckeye. Yeah, one of the coolest things about this eye in the sky is we recruit these players to come in and play a position. Uh, a couple weeks ago, I'm at Lakota East, and Austin Sierraveld's a punter. Correct. Uh, Incredible. Yeah, not something he's going to do in college, but you get to see these kids perform and do a task where he was an elite punter, the thump, and we talked about it last week. You show up and watch Elias Rudolph. Uh, he's a dominating tight end. Uh, watching him block, he had a couple of pancakes. He set the edge. They were actually sending him into the game to run behind him. What you're alluding to is on defense. They threw him down at nose man. One technique. And he does not look like a nose man in a million years. He's as long and stringy as they get at 6'5", 220. Uh, but what they've done is they've said, we're tired of putting Elias on one side of the defense and having right. teams simply audible to the other side and run away all night. It's a, it's, it's a waste of the player. We're not using him very much. So the coaches said, yeah, we have other guys that can play defensive end in high school. Let's put him at the nose and at the snap of the ball, try to run away from him. He's going to chase you to either side. And that's exactly what he was doing. And, and what I love about it is you're going to force development and progression out of Elias this year because he is going to be forced to come off the ball and play with his hands. If right. his hands aren't on the center at the snap of the ball and he's not locking them out, Elias is going to be standing straight up and get double teamed by some big linemen. So he's going to learn to play low. And if you saw the film, he is playing low. He is down in a three-point track stance. The shoulder pads are low, flat back, shedding guys. And he is getting to the C and D gap to both sides and playing along that offensive line. Pass rushing, he's blowing the gaps. And he got to come off the edge a couple times. It's not like they're not putting him out at defensive end in certain packages. Uh off the edge, he's going to be unstoppable in high school. His first and second step, most tackles aren't even in their kick step yet. He really embarrassed the tackle that I watched him go against. There's a play where he does a spin move. The kid can barely get a hand. He runs by him another time. The kid's falling down on his back. So the explosive traits that don't match the nose man position is what Elias is known for. They're still there. And as far as his body type since Ohio State this summer, he was – Probably only about 210 or 205 this summer. He looked really lean, but he looks like he's put on a little weight. And with those leaner frames, the weight comes on slower. So it's going to come on steady, but it'll come on slow. So I want to say he's up to 215 or 220. By the time he gets to 230 or 240 or 50, he'll be an unbelievable player for Ohio State. It may take a redshirt year, but what you're buying is the explosion out of the blocks. It, it's rare. It's different, and it shows up on film and live every time you see it. And then the last part of Elias, what he did for us, is he brought the juice or the energy. Um, you see there's a clip of him standing on the bench, getting everybody going. After his big plays, he's got a little routine or a sack dance he does. And you can tell he's having fun, and his teammates are feeding off it, and the coaches are feeding off it. And it doesn't seem to be a cocky or braggadocious type of uh, feeling. It seems to be more confident, fun, you know, uh, bring the energy to your teammates. Uh, you're the leader. They're expecting you to be the Superman with the cape. Can you do it for your team? I think that's the role I saw him in up there. Uh, and, boy, I would go back and see him again because watching him every time has been enjoyable. Uh, just puts on a show for you and gives you plenty to show the fans. Pretty sure the last guy Ohio State offered at a tap was Adolphus Washington. That worked out quite well. Man, what a high school player he was. By the way, I think he was Division II basketball player of the year one year. Adolphus Washington, a great player. All right, quick break, pay some bills here, come back, and we'll let you guys have at it with Mark. All right, we are back. Theoretically, some bills paid there. And there was a great question here, Mark. We're going to start with this one. Okay. Larry Ventresco, one of our best question askers especially when we are talking Ohio preps. Let's do this in reverse order here. Is Ben Roebuck, is ben Roebuck a Buckeye caliber player? A little background and your answer. Uh, ben is about a 6'7", 300 and some pound, plus pound offensive lineman who has lost a lot of weight. 
Uh, playing for St. Edwards, obviously, he's in a premier program, premier competition. The only thing with him sophomore year is his feet were a little heavier and he didn't bend as well as some of the other guys. Uh, we've taken linemen like Trey LaRue and these other big guys like Ben that you take and you mold after a couple you know, seasons. So, yes, I think Ben Roebuck is equal to the talent that has been taken by Ohio State in the past. I think they're doing their due diligence on this 24 class with Luke Campbell and some of the other guys in Ohio before they fire an offer to Roebuck. Um, I wouldn't be surprised if the offer came after the season or once they kind of had a board put together where they do have a national idea of what's out there. Uh, you hate to offer someone on your board, you know, before you know what's out there totally nationally. I, I use this analogy all the time. If you had a list of your top 20 girls you want to go to homecoming with and it's six months before homecoming, you're not asking the number 17th ranked girl on your list of homecoming. You're waiting to see if the fourth <laughs> or fifth girl breaks up with their boyfriend and then maybe you get a better pick. So not that Robux the 17th best guy on the board right now, but Ohio State is waiting to see if there's any other hot offensive lineman out there, for lack of a better term. And then that's the way they'll go about their business. But I think Roebuck is OSU caliber. The size, the power is there. Uh, just like some of the other linemen they've taken, it might take a while before they decide if he's a tackle or guard, okay, if he does have the elite feet to protect the edge. When I broke him down a few weeks ago, he is playing left tackle now. He's out there on the edge doing that stuff. And I thought the reason I'm giving him my – seal of approvals. I thought he was as light as he's ever looked. I thought he was as flexible as he's ever looked. And obviously with people like me criticizing him all summer about those traits and him reading the internet, I think he's identified it and put the work in and actually changed his body. Remember kids at this age can change their body still and change the way they, yeah. So they have, it's not like they're finished products and he's such a young kid that yeah. Uh, as far as uh, the best player in Ohio. Well, I've ever yeah, let me read that out for those for those listening to the podcast, the other question in from Larry was Mark, who is the best Ohio football player you have ever scouted? Yeah, that, that question always gets me because every year there's two or three top of the food chain players. And, and I disrespect, uh, how do I say decades of players I've seen when I pick one, Marshawn Lattimore, I've always said, just jumped off the film. I mean, or jumped off the field. As soon as you saw him in person, like a receiver, running back, I mean, he was so good at receiver or running back. I still can't believe he's not a receiver yep. or running back. Um, Elite return guy, too, by the way. Yeah. And, and you know, just every time he plays Mike Evans, I'm reminded how good he is. When you – they read off Mike Evans' stats over the past five or six years when he's manned up with Marshawn Lattimore. He's lucky if a ball touches his fingertips. That's how dominating Marshawn Lattimore is in the NFL. And it's a quiet domination because you don't hear much about corners or – Saints fans aren't buzzing around Ohio, but Marshawn Lattimore was one. I I was before the days of the Beanie Wells and the Maurice Clorettes, a lot of the historic guys and Orlando Paces that Ohio State fans like. But, of course, all the Ohio State guys that have come through, all the NFL guys have come through. I've, I've really watched them all. But I, I can remember sitting there watching Marshawn as a sophomore thinking, if this kid's not one of the best I've ever seen, then I'm not doing this right because he was absolutely incredible. As far as Marshawn Lattimore at Ohio State, we've had this lineage of number one draft picks and corners. He had the best mirror skills that I have ever seen from a college corner. It's almost preternatural in the way he can move with you, and that's probably why he's been so fantastic in the NFL. And Mike Evans, by the way, will be taking the week off after meeting up with Marshawn Lattimore. As, uh, he gets a little fired up for that too. Let's talk – uh, this is uh, – Neck of the woods here. Centerville looks good this year. Thoughts on Springboro Centerville. Believe it or not, believe it or not, my son actually played AAU ball with Springboro's head football coach this offseason, and Centerville is a traditional power here for those with Dayton roots. What are your thoughts? You know, that was one of the games I was going to go to this week, but I decided to go see Finley and check out some teams in the Toledo area. I want to see Fremont Ross. I want to see St. Francis de Sales up there. So I was going to go to that game. That's how intriguing it was to me. Uh, I can't give a prediction because, you know, people ask me about these games all the time. When I go at a game, I leave a game sometimes, and people say, what was the score? And I'll say, I have no idea. Right. I was staring at a left tackle. Uh, I was staring at a DB. Uh, I know a couple times they scored, but I really wasn't concerned with who was winning or who had the young quarterback. And a lot of times when I look at the roster, if you're a senior – I don't really pay much attention to you because I've probably already scouted you or you're not really a college prospect at that point. So 
everybody asks me, Mark, who do you think is going to win this game? Or you should know who's going to. A lot of times I'm not paying attention to the true makeup of a team. I'm paying attention to three people on the field that night and using a, you know, crawling up their butt to try to find out everything about them that night. And I'm kind of blacking out and not paying attention to the rest of the stuff. So I kind of, you know, walk away from the question with that answer. But uh, from a perspective uh, standpoint or a prospect standpoint, Centerville has three or four guys that I'd want to go back and see again. I saw the Powers kid again this summer. He's the one that comes to the mind, Reggie Powers. Uh, he might be listed at safety. I think he's on his way to linebacker. Saw him at West Virginia, Ohio State, probably four other times, and he got bigger and thicker. He's a powerful guy, so I think that's the way he'll go. Uh, a lot of good prospects on both those teams, actually, parentally. But sorry, I gave you a long answer and didn't answer the question, actually. As I'd love to insert my children, the same son also played with Reggie Powers in the eighth grade. So Reggie Powers is a solid little dude. Um, tough to guard in the eighth grade, and his body has gone towards football. Centerville, of course. Probably the defending state champions. Uh, no, they lost in the state championship to Sonny Styles in basketball. And the Sonny Styles questions, we could spend all day answering those. We're going to finish with this one. We get this question almost every week. Mark, why is there not many or any at all in the Columbus City League talent-wise from an Ohio State perspective? Not that common to get a guy out of the city. Yeah, I could do a dissertation on this answer. And you could change out Columbus City League with Toledo City League, Youngstown City League, uh, Dayton Area City League. What's what's happened over the years, and, and, and I'm trying to use a good example, is the feeder schools in those areas are dying. You know, the middle schools and places like that don't feed into those schools the way they used to. The second part is a lot of athletes have learned that, hey, if, if I'm a top-of-the-food chain athlete by 8, 10, 12 years old, You've probably been identified by youth coaches as top of the food chain. And the word's out. There's too many high schools in those areas that will say, hey, come play with us, transfer out, and we'll take you. And I think that's where the dilution really problem is with the feeder schools and the best players being taken out. And then what you're left with is programs and teams that are just a shell of what they would be. And they play other teams just like them that are a shell of what they be and the development isn't there. The off-season programs aren't there. The commitment to the sport isn't there. So when you put that whole snowball and you start it rolling downhill, you're not developing players. You're not bringing. You're not making them compete at a high level. So you're never going to see a player get its full development at some of the city schools. Now, making that blank statement is ignorant about all the city schools. There are, of course, right. coaches and programs that pull it off. I mean, Glenville is a city as it gets up there, and you know they pull it off. They have the commitment to the weight room. They have the feeder programs and the people out there, they have the ability to tap a kid on the shoulder and say, if you come here, look at the success that is going on here. Where a lot of those schools, when they, and I'm thinking of some in my head, and I don't want to say them out loud, when they tap you on the shoulder, there is no history or, you know, them saying, look at all the, the lineage. Uh, Ohio State does find kids out of Walnut Ridge, Malik Harrison, you know, places like that because talent still shows up anywhere. And, and you know, when God gives it to you, he doesn't screw up. So, yeah, you can be anywhere, you know, and we have a kid in Amish territory this year that was from a Columbus City school, actually, and transferred up to Amish territory. But you can come from anywhere. You know, I've driven to the all corners of this state and every division of this state to find players. So it's not like there's a, you know, a, something going against these city schools. But the, the day and age is definitely the, the schools around the city have, have grown up so much. And it's just it's so easy for kids to transfer out. And, and I think this is a psychology thing. Kids like to feel wanted and their parents feel wanted. It'd go where you're wanted, not where you're tolerated. You know, so there's a little bit of that there. So when these teams recruit you, I think, you know, it makes you feel special and you feel like you're leaving something for a greener pasture. Unfortunately, they're also usually leaving for a school or program that has more resources from the coaching, from the, you know, everything that goes into running a football program. It's a big deal running a quality football program with that many kids and that many obstacles that you face at those schools. That's a very challenging thing to be a coach there. Um, coaches there are sometimes have responsibilities they don't have in more affluent areas. You, you're, you're a chauffeur, you're a coach, you're a counselor in a lot of times. So more power okay. to all those guys who are putting the time in to do that because it is not an easy job. If you've ever had a chance to speak to a 
city league coach, they will tell you some stories behind the scenes. And those guys are big assets to the community. And we are very appreciative of the individuals who are willing to do that. I lied. Here's going to be our yeah. lap. Go ahead. Yeah. The ahead. stories that I get from those coaches Incredible. are heartbreaking. When, when they yeah. say they're, you know, uh, third world problems and first world problems, some yeah. of these teams don't even understand what problems are from, I mean, I, I kids don't have water running in their house. Don't yeah. have three meals a day, you know, like parents that don't have enough money to buy tickets for the game that night. Sure. I mean, your parents can't come to the game because they can't afford to bring the family at six or $8 a piece, you know? So, I, I just I hate to you know bring up all these stories, but boy, are there there are different worlds of football in Ohio high school, and I'm sure we could do a whole podcast on you know stuff like that. We're going to finish with this one, Tom Pauling. You somewhat alluded to your Amish fascination here. Have you ever found that diamond in the rough in a small high school? If you could be specific here, maybe tell somebody, tell the group a name you saw that you surprised that surprised you out of a small place that turned out to be a quality player. Yeah, uh, Colton McKibbitts at Union Local. And I didn't even know Union Locals in Ohio. I think that could probably be in any state. Uh, Springfield? But the, yeah, <laughs> there you go. It's down near the West Virginia border. And about seven or eight years ago, I go down to a scrimmage at Union Local to see Colton McKibbitts, and he's a 6'7", 240-pound offensive and defensive lineman. And by the time the scrimmage was over, I was pretty sure I'd never seen a worse high school football player play football. Uh, he was big. He was awkward. He was getting destroyed by 5'10", 190-pound defensive lineman. I pretty much assured myself on the way home I would never go to a school that small again and waste my time on a kid like that again. He's the left tackle for the San Francisco 49ers right now. Uh, there was a lot of injuries last year, and he got called up off the you know streets, and he's, he played, and now he's still on the team. I, I don't know if he's starting right now, but he was for the second half of the year last year. Now, he went to West Virginia, had a great career. Uh, when he got a scholarship from West Virginia, I had to go back and watch the film. And just like all young linemen, yeah, the development came late. It wasn't there initially. But Colton McKivitz, if you Google him, yeah, I wouldn't have given a nickel that day for his future. And, you know, I know the question was, have you found anyone from a small school that you knew was the diamond in the rough? Yeah, there, there was a kid at West Holmes that ended up going to Kent State. You find guys like that. But this was one where I went there and I was dead wrong. And I – still think to myself, go back to that film you shot that day and watch that again and maybe send that to him and let him know where he started from. Because really, I remember walking out of there as a scout going, I cannot like recommend this kid to anybody right now on my name or they're going to laugh at me. And hats off to players like that that do develop and, you know, obviously identify the same things I did and work on them. And, and we're, we just talked about Ben Roebuck. There were things about him that he's worked on. So, you know, all these linemen, they are late bloomers. Now, that was a good answer for Diamond in the Rough. Uh, the San Francisco punchline there kind of jolted me back. That was fantastic. But that's what you get here with Mark. He is the best at what he does. If anyone who watched this or knows anything about Mark knows that. so I think we had a question about T.C. Caffey. Tonight. Oh, that's right. Yep. See, and he's also better at hosting the show. Uh, T.C. Caffey became an overnight sensation uh, last week. Got in run oh, that uh, we run a loop and we running on a loop in the Caffey household for probably years now. And the question is, why was he lightly recruited? Um, a couple reasons. Uh, he was a tweener. Okay. And he had a lot of stats at Hubbard, like a couple thousand yard season, best player in the area. I mean, he, he really went nuts his senior year. Uh, dad played at Toledo and they didn't offer him a scholarship that kind of put a chip on his shoulder. He is a high academic uh, player. He wants to be a doctor. So that actually superseded any scholarship or anything that would have happened. Uh, he actually got a scholarship to Ohio State because of his academics and other things. So he decided if I'm going to go somewhere, anywhere, and I'm going to be a doctor, if I want to play football, why not do it at Ohio State, I believe was his thinking. Like, hey, if I'm going to make it, I might as well try it there. Why go to another school and be a doctor and walk on somewhere else? So, yeah, they gave him a chance. And Boy, you know, coming out of high school, there wasn't really a knock on him. I watched this film a couple times, and, of course, I had local coaches banging on me saying, why is this kid not getting anything? That tailback offer is a tough offer to get. I mean, three or five in Ohio get it every year at most, so the top three tailbacks maybe are what impress college coaches, and he was right there. He had a tons of Division II FCS offers. 
was a, a you know preferred walk on at all the Mac schools. And I think if you, maybe he really wanted to go the Mac direction and wasn't thinking about being a doctor, there might have been that offer there for him. But I joked on the eye in the sky, uh, he made Toledo pay for not offering him that scholarship. And anytime you get backups in the game for Ohio State, those kids might be playing the hardest they've ever played in their lives because their dream is being realized. And they know that this might be the only six or eight snaps they get all year. So you're going to get six or eight of the most intense reps you've ever seen. So when he came out of that pile, yeah, that's the type of effort he gave in the past. But, boy, I, I was like, yeah, he gets his chance. He's not going down. You're going to have to rip his helmet off to get him down. So hey, actually a great story for him and especially for a local kid around here. He could have scored that touchdown, run right out of the tunnel, go put on his white lab coat and still been a legend at Ohio State. That was a very cool way to do it. Once again, we appreciate Mark stopping by. Like I said, there's just nobody better in the business for this kind of information. He's a tremendous asset. We love to have him. Again, Buckeye in the Sky, Mondays, covers the game. Buckeye in the Sky, Tuesdays, the high school week, and then all Mark during the week. We appreciate him stopping by. Have a good one, Bucknutters.